Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this series of videos, and I'm not sure how many it will take, but I'll just keep going until I uh, finish everything I want to say. I'm going to talk about what will happen to the radiative forcing on the Earth, or in other words, how much heating will we get when we have a blue ocean event. So when we have zero sea ice in the Arctic, um, how much... Um, additional heating will there be. So I'm going to talk about all, about all about this Pistone et al. paper, peer-reviewed paper, that is arguing that the addition, basically it's arguing that since 1979, when at the start of the satellite era to about 2016, the loss of sea ice was equivalent to a global warming of 0 0.21 watts per square meter and that when there's absolutely no sea ice, that will jump to the warming since 1979 will be 0 0.71 watts per square meter. Now, just to put this in context, this is a huge amount of additional heating. And in fact, if you convert it into the amount of heating globally from CO2 increase, it would be equivalent to about a 57 parts per million CO2 increase, or in terms of um, emissions, just about 25 years of emissions at the present rate, which is about 40 gigatons per year times 25 years. That's about a trillion tons of additional CO2 into the atmosphere. That's how much the warming equivalence is of the loss, total loss of Arctic sea ice. And to put that in perspective, um, up until 20, up until now, basically, we put 2.4 trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Our emissions, basically, what we put up in, what goes up into the atmosphere is about 44% of our total emissions. So we've emitted more with land use changes, etc take that number, multiply it by 44%, and uh, that's basically how much has gone up into the, into the uh, atmosphere. So 25 years of additional warming just from, from uh, complete loss of Arctic sea ice. So I apologize in advance. This, these next videos are going to be very technical, but I'm going to try to explain them so that it's easily understood. But this, this is crucial information for what will happen to our world when we have a complete loss of sea ice. For the occasion, of course, I've got Shackleton the Explorer here, very well behaved, and I'm getting cat furs all over my clothes. So the blue shirt is symbolic of a blue ocean, and the uh, blue tie, these are laser beams, is um, indicative of the laser-like focus, which I'm going to talk about the, these, these grave issues with you. Okay, so let's get right into the details. A um, little plug for my website, paulbeckwith.net, and, uh, you know, please consider clicking here, you know, even coffee money or whatever. It all helps me uh, do these videos and get this very important information to you. Okay, so this is the paper, Radiative Heating of an Ice-Free Arctic Ocean. I talked about this paper a bit in some previous videos, but I couldn't find it, so I, I requested, you know, I said, if anybody finds it, send it to me. And I want to thank, you know, there were multiple people, many, many people. I think I got about 20 different people that sent me copies of, the, of this paper. So I, I want to thank everybody that did that. So a couple of the key things, key points. The complete disappearance of Arctic sea ice would contribute an additional solar radiative heating of 0 0.71 watts per meter squared to the planet. This is equivalent to the radiative forcing from 1 trillion tons of CO2 emissions. The added solar heating from complete Arctic sea ice loss would be an order of magnitude larger in the month of May than in the month of September. So. When I'm looking, I'm going to go through some of the, the, the techniques that I use when I'm reading a paper. So, of course, this is key, and this is not talked about 
very much. So let's go to, you know, let's look at the amount of sun in the Arctic throughout the year. So if I Google, go to Google Images and Google solar radiation versus latitude for seasons, I get all these images. And this one here is actually quite good. So I clicked on here and I, I brought up, it brought up this article here. And there's a couple key plots in here. Okay, so Earth-Sun relationships and insulation. Okay, so here's hours of, day of daylight, hours of day length throughout the year, January through December. At the equator, it's 12 hours, okay? You don't get, it, you don't get seasons at the equator. Every day of the year is 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. As you go to higher and higher latitudes, you get a variation from summer to winter. So this is 30 degrees, 50 degrees. I'm at about 45 degrees north, Ottawa. So we get about 16 hours of daylight at the June solstice. At the equinoxes, you always get day, hours of day equals hours of night, darkness. And then in the, win in the winter, we go down at 45 degrees north, we go down to about eight hours of light, 16 hours of darkness in the winter. And it goes right up to 70 degrees north. You know, how do you define the Arctic? I mean, the, if you talk about the water north of 70 degrees or north of 60 degrees, you can see the corresponding increase. And what you notice is when you go high enough north, you get 24 hours of uh, daylight at the June solstice, June 21st, and you get 24 hours of darkness. And if you go right up to 90 degrees, then, well, this is what you get here. This is, okay, so, so this is the hours of day length. And of course, you have the sun at a certain angle coming in, so you can figure out the amount of energy, the insulation in watts per meter squared throughout the whole year, January through December, at different latitudes. Okay, so, this is at zero degrees, okay? So the angle of the sun is changing slightly. You know, you're still getting 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness at the equator, but the angle of the sun is moving, right? So when the sun is directly overhead and close, you know, it sh the angle is shining down, the, in the insulation is watts per unit area. So if it's directly overhead, it's, the area is gonna be smallest, minimized, so the insulation will be greater. So this is a variation, not much variation in insulation at the equator. Um, now this is the June solstice, June 21st. The equinoxes are when you have 12 hours of night, 12 hours of day at all locations on the earth for the equinoxes. So we have the March 21st, the March equinox, the September equinox, equinox being equal day and night. And then we have the solstices, when the sun is highest in the sky is the June solstice for the Northern Hemisphere. This is at 90 degrees north. And the December solstice is when the sun is lowest in the sky. So if we're in the Arctic at 90 degrees north, okay, you get this sort of curve. So the insulation, notice um, at the June solstice, the, the insulation the watts per square meter at the Arctic is higher at the North Pole than anywhere else on the planet. Look how high it is here. It's like 520 or so. You know, it's even, it's higher. This is 60 degrees latitude. This is 30 degrees latitude and zero. So it's, so the, you know, in, in, in when the June solstice in the, at 90 degree north, you know, we get very, very high levels. But notice the sharpness of the decline and it goes to zero on the equinoxes. So March 21st, September 21st, it goes to zero. So the Arctic is lit up for this time period and it's in complete darkness for this time period. Sorry, the North Pole. So how far do you have to go? You know, so let's have a look at the Arctic because let's have a look at a map of the Arctic. So here is the sea ice from right now. This is concentration. Um, this is from Bremen. And you can see this is 90 degrees north. This is 85, 80, 75, 70. So most of the water in the Arctic is north of 70 degrees. So let's have a look at what happens at 70 degrees here. Okay, well, we've got 60. So let's go back and have a look. 
So this is 70, 65, 60. Some people say this is 50, 55, 60. Yeah, so this line here of latitude is 60. Some people define the Arctic as north of 60. Some people say north of the Arctic Circle. Some people say north of 70. Let's take, so I've got data for north of 60. There's a line for north of 60 here. So if we define that as a complete Arctic, what you notice is that the insulation through the year, you know, it doesn't peak as high as at the North Pole, but it doesn't vanish at the equinoxes. There's still sunlight in September, October, November, December. You know, it's decreasing rapidly, but there's still some light. So when we talk about the sea ice, you know, so this is the 60 curve, the 70 curve, you can, you can get do these for the 70, 75, et cetera degrees north and what you notice is that the you know when the September sea ice minimum happens the light's been dropping off very very rapidly okay I mean obviously loss of Arctic sea ice you know in the summer months is much more key to radiative effects because you know if we lose all the Arctic sea ice you know but it's complete darkness in the Arctic we're not going to get additional heating because of loss of sea ice Right, and you need to consider cloud cover as well. So keep keep this sort of image in mind here, right? So what that means is when we lose Arctic sea ice in September, okay, um, you know, the, at the North Pole, the water is not going to be heating anymore. It goes into darkness. You know, this kind of this the steepness of this curve kind of explains why the minimum when it happens generally is about September fifteenth. Um, last year it was a week later, I believe, but it was right about the equinox last year. But when you when when the sea ice vanishes at this time, there's very little light. There's almost no light. There's no light at the North Pole, and as you go to lower and lower latitude ice, say 80, 70, 60, you get there is some sunlight still, but it's rapidly dropping. So the ice starts freezing up pretty rapidly at that point. So the question is is you know, when we are after the first blue ocean event in September, and then we go to, uh, you know, a few years later, I say August and October will have no sea ice. You know, maybe it will lean t more towards the summer months having, I mean, the, the loss of sea ice in the summer months as we head to October and earlier will have a huge impact on the warming in the Arctic, whereas the, the loss of the ice in October won't have such a large effect because of these, these curves. So I hope that's pretty clear to you. Okay. Um, okay. So if you look at the now, how much light is being reflected in the Arctic? Because the big key question is, what will the albedo or reflectance of the Arctic be when there's with a complete loss of sea ice? And I've mentioned in the past the 52% reflectivity in '79 overall from the Arctic. I think that's defined as north of 60 degrees for that um, definition of the Arctic, you know, that 52% drops to um, 48% um, by 2011 or so. So I'll show some curves of that. But let's talk a little bit about reflectance and albedo. So I googled um, reflectivity of snow versus the angle of incidence. Okay, um, is that the curve I want? Yes. Yes, okay, so reflectivity of snow versus angle of incidence, because I wanted to see, okay, the snow on the land, for example, or on the ice, you know, what, what will it be? What will be the reflectivity or albedo? If I expand this image here, then basically this is the type of image. So this is the reflectivity of the surface to diffuse light. So light coming down, different pol all different polarizations. Um, the reflectivity of water is very low. Okay, this is 10%, so it's less than 10. This is, this is uh, diffuse light, but it's basically normal incidence coming down, how much light is reflected back up. Because the reflectance back up depends greatly on the angle. If the light's coming in this way, the reflectance will be quite different from if the light's coming in this way. So this is normal incidence or light coming straight down. Soils are dark, forests are generally dark, meadows, crops, right? This is the range, desert, desert sands will be lighter. Ice is higher, but snow, old snow can be about 40, just over 40, new snow over 80. And then you have the clouds, cumulus clouds, different types of clouds. So I'll continue. Thanks for listening.